questions. But we have uh, two very <coughs> experienced, uh, long-serving leaders of the trade union movement. Very experienced. I'm deliberately not talking about age. Um, <laughs> and um, the one sitting to my left, Vala Tampoe, will be introduced by Dan because uh, they know each other for a long time and he can do it far better than I can. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you will have noticed that this summer school is uh, the, the uh, emphasis is on youth and uh, young trade unionists, uh, etc. Uh, this morning session is different. Uh, Bala and I total up 173 years between the two of us. <laughs> and uh, we first party soon after. For those of you who don't understand the thing I'm saying, I can general secretary of any union in the world for, for 65 or years. Uh, and uh, uh, this union is a Ceylon Mercantile Industrial General Workers Union probably the best union in, uh, in Ceylon and, and, and uh, in many other places. It's uh, uh, been uh, a great experience working with him in the, in the IOF. <coughs> and, uh, I was General Secretary of the IOF in a previous life uh, before I was uh, the uh, founder of the Global Labour Institute in Geneva. And uh, <coughs> therefore, I would like to first let Bala uh, make his presentation. I will, I will respond and add some things later on and open to discussion. Thank you. Okay, so we have, uh, so we have 45 minutes left and um, as far as I understood, Dan, if you somehow <laughs> sorted out how we divide this between you two, I would kindly ask you maybe to leave 10 minutes for discussion. This would be great. But otherwise, of course, they are both with us for the rest of the week. And uh, I think uh, they, uh, they would be happy to answer any questions uh, throughout the week. So, Bala, you have to go. Okay. Uh, well, good morning, friends and comrades. Uh, somebody hesitated to mention age. <laughs> Not only because of me. But I'm not ashamed to say that I'm 91 years old. Wow. <laughs> and having said that, I was also mentioned what Dan said. I've been 65 years the general secretary of my union. So for those reasons, and the fact that I was first in politics, when I joined an underground party in my country banned by the British during World War II. So my experience of what might be called politics in a broad sense dates back to 1942 during World War II. So with that background and experience, I was wondering what to say here in 20 minutes. <laughs> but I've also learned from experience and been told that in my case, the shorter time I've given, the better I speak. And I once spoke over the BBC to the Eastern Service and he said, you have two and a half minutes. And I spoke for two minutes. And he said, perfect. <laughs> I've also just mentioned that in my lifetime I've been to many countries mainly because of my having become a training agent. <coughs> so I've been able to travel to almost every country in South and Southeast Asia except Nepal. I've also been able to go to the West to Europe and to the United States and once 
to Latin America. I won't take more than under me just to say, I've also had a rare experience of addressing blacks in Harlem mm -hmm. at the height of the, the Vietnam War, against the Vietnam War, United States. And I also spoke in Harvard University, where I was invited to take part in the Harvard International Seminar, organized by Henry Kissinger. And then I spoke in the Harvard Forum with five other Asian speakers. I was given 10 minutes to say what I had to say about the US in Vietnam. So I decided not to make a speech, not to try to argue, but just to state. So I started by saying, if I were in the United States today, I'd be fighting arms in hand with the Viet Cong to kill or drive the American out of Vietnam. And I was interested to find at that time, 1967, out of that Harvard audience, about 60 to 70 percent of the questions came at me. And the next day, Kissing himself, he had gone abroad on a secret mission. He came back. And he called me up at the end of the morning session and he said, what's this you've been saying to upset the natives on Vietnam? <laughs> he was referring to the Americans as natives, he's German. So I knew somebody must have said what I said. So I said, why do you ask? He said, you know I have a housewife. He was divorced and not remarried. So he had a housewife. But I would call it typical middle class, middle aged American woman. He said, What have you been? He said, From last night, she's talking about that man from Ceylon, as myself. What have you been saying? Up to now, she had had orthodox views on Vietnam, but since yesterday, she's asking me about the Vietnam War. Now today, I'm asked by our good comrade here, Dave, to speak to you on what has been put down here as a political challenge for the international trade union organizations. But even my good comrade Dan, in Exchanging emails with me, he referred not to the international trade union organizations but to the international trade union movement. And I told that I personally do not think that this is a thing to be called the international trade union movement. To have the main international Confrontation of trade unions, now called, I think, the International Trade Union Congress. Is that correct? Confrontation. Formerly it was called the ICFC, International Confrontation of Free Trade Unions. My union never affiliated to that organization, nor to its successor as renamed. And I must say, when I came into the trade union movement in 1948, which was just three years after World War II ended, in my country, we regarded all trade unions, organizations in the West as involved one way or another collaborating with and what we called Anglo-American imperialism. Now today I don't use that kind of terminology. But this much I will say straight away because there's not enough time. I'm asked to address you on a political challenge. But my own view is, I must tell they and Dan will help to organize this program. I would rather that it be called 
or ask the question, what is the social challenge to the international trade union organizations? Because today, what we are faced with in this world is essentially a social challenge, a challenge which really goes down to the fundamental question of the survival of humanity on this planet. Today, all of you are familiar with talk of climate change. <coughs> but society, as it is constituted globally, <coughs> is affected with the question of global challenge. That is an outcome of a particular means or methods of production in this country and in the world that continues to climate change. But under the capitalist system, as it works, the people who help that system and dominate production or services in this system, they don't really consider climate change and gain that to their system. Now, in the United States, <coughs> When I went there, there was a big problem of black liberation. That question also affects even today the United States and racial questions affect many countries in the world including mine. Those of you who are familiar with my own country which is now called Sri Lanka, we have had a 30 year civil war which has ended with a complete military defeat and destruction of the leadership of that LTT. I happen to be also a lawyer who practiced mainly criminal law, but in my capacity as a lawyer, I defended a Catholic priest charged with the Indian wedding, what's called the LTT, in laundering funds. So I'm not speaking to you then, merely as a trade unionist. I would say, and I think Dan will agree as far as he's concerned, I would describe myself today no longer as just a Marxist or a Trotskyist or a socialist, but just as a humanist, as a humanist, humanist. Because I've learned from my life experience that to address your fellow human beings, you have to bear in mind that they, like you, are human beings. And in my union, I once told an economic consultant from the World Bank who came to discuss with me labor law reform. We got talking on other subjects and in the course of it, I said that my union, General Council, had decided to do all in its power to prevent two major American transnationals <coughs> from setting foot in an ancient part of our country where there's a large, very valuable phosphate deposit and in the world market there is a demand for phosphates particularly because of development now in China and in India and they came really with hundreds of American dollars to buy up this deposit, excavate it and put it on the world market. Well, a Buddhist senior high priest of an ancient temple in that area, who is a high priest also for five other temples. He is himself from an ancient village. <coughs> he organized a defense of the what was the name of the place is Epaval, of the Epaval phosphate deposit. And this is interesting to you, since you are most of you worker representatives like me, he was a peasant 
on an entirely ancient peasant rural area where his deposit is. But he decided, having mobilized that movement there in the villages surrounding that area, to come to Colombo to seek the assistance of trade union leaders like myself. Because he said, we are in an isolated part of the country. If the police repress us or even attack us, the press might suppress that. But we need the support of the workers in Kalambo, the urban working class. So I said, our general council meets next week. Our general council, we have a demo, very democratic union. All elected representatives of the general council meet once a month in our union. So I said, I invited him to address our general council. And sitting and listening to him, I must tell you, I thought to myself, people like me don't know that people like this exist in our own country. He was a high priest of the Buddhist temple from a rural area. He had just our members of our general council and we had a general union. And he had just them on the theme of what is in common interests of the people of Epal, rural peasants, <coughs> with workers like ours in the urban neighborhoods. And I just thought to myself, this kind of man is not heard much even in our own country. He and I became very close personal friends. <coughs> he regularly visits my headquarters and I have been to his temple. You might be interested to know. I even thought if I were to retire, and I don't think I get a chance to retire. <laughs> <laughs> no, I tell you that. See, <coughs> my members will not let, let go of me as I say till I drop dead in their presence. But I thought to myself, if I retire, I'd like to go to that priest temple and spend whatever final period I have with him meditating in his temple. And he invited me during the course of that campaign to address his defense committee in what's called the Vadamadura, that's the preaching part of the temple. And he said, because he's well versed with the law and the traditions of our country as a Buddhist country for 2500 years and more. He said in the time of our ancient kings, the kings had, when they had to fight wars, they had armies and they had military leaders. And then he said, mentioning me, that I have experience in organizing workers and I have conducted more strikes in my country than any other, any other union. So he said that I could help them to organize their struggle which is then what I tried to do. And we ended up that struggle with a big demonstration in Colombo, where my union called a half-day general strike and a big picket line in front of the main railway station. And in the end, the government gave up the project and the first rate deposit <laughs> remains for the people of our country properly to utilize even the next 200 years. Now I just mentioned those two things. Because today in the world, and particularly in the trade union movement, this word solidarity is freely used. Solidarity, even Comrade Dave yesterday said, we can at least send the emails expressing solidarity. Now I've been in several international, what are now called global unions, Dan persuaded me to join the IUF and he also persuaded me not to shun the other trade union organizations in the West and he went to join them and experience what I could from being in them. So after joining the IUF, my union affiliated to what was known as the ICEM, the ITF, the IFBWW, the ITZLWF and also 
what was called Yuni, public trust. I am going to cut short. You can ask me any question you like that interests you. I told Dave when I walked in, I read this document. Organizing the global workplace, unite educational message network. I read two statements of some of you, unite trade union leaders, and also from one here, from Jack Ryder. Now, I've met and heard Jack Ryder in other congresses, and Jack Ryder, when he made the, this message, created the general secretary of the IUC. But today, he is the director general of the ILO. And there has just been a conference, annual conference of the ILO last June. And in the ILO conference, I asked the deputy general secretary of my union, who went to Geneva, what was the main theme of this ILO conference? He said, job creation and decent work. Well, both those terms, I think you all know about. <laughs> I must say that. These are just slogans. The trade union movement and the working class, which is broader than the trade union movement, can demand job creation. But the system, the capitalist system, today survives by destroying jobs. They create some new jobs, but much larger number are destroyed. Last week, I met the chairman of the entire food sector of the biggest single company in our country to discuss re restructuring in one important company called Keels Food. Where my members are the workers in the factory. And this factory has to downsize. The chairman met me personally, one to one, to explain why they have to downsize. Because they have bought up another factory, small one, that was <coughs> set up by a competitor with modern, more developed technology for food. <coughs> They make chicken sausages, pork sausages, etc. With a factory of about 15 employed through a labor contractor, they can now produce more than the factory where my union is organized with over 200 workers. I think of nearly 300, 261. So he said, we want to downsize. And about 125 jobs. The rest can get, can continue till retire. Our country, manual workers retire 55. They can continue to retire <coughs> if the others voluntarily retire and we give them a package, compensation. He has offered a package of 130 million. And how this is to be divided? That's the question we discussed. That is more than what the law offers under an act of parliament called the Termination of Employment of Workers Act. And you may be interested to know that that act came into being primarily because my union fighting retrenchment of workers in the 1970s organized in one year, 70 strikes of over one month's duration, fighting mainly against termination of employment. And the then Prime Minister, a conservative union government Prime Minister, Dagi Senanai, asked his cabinet minister, his cabinet secretary, who had been with me in school on a, on a more senior level, to arrange a one-to-one -one meeting with him. <clears throat> so I went and met him one night. He was after dinner. He was wearing his sarong, not shirt and trousers. And I had a talk with him for about two hours. 
and he asked me, why is your union organizing so many strikes? I said, because the employers, whether it suits them, they just decide that they don't need so many people and they terminate. At that time there was no act. So he said, so what do you think we should do? I said, well at least, why not bring a law by which you have a state appointed authority to hold an inquiry before an employer terminates employment, not after. Because after it takes years then to go through labor tribunals. So he was a fairly liberal minded prime minister at that time. He said that's a good idea. And then he called an official meeting with my union as prime minister and with the minister of labor and the commissioner of labor and asked me to present a memorandum, which I did. And then he did, told the, the minister of labor to draft a law. And then the Minister of Labor called me because the Commissioner said Bala is a lawyer. So he proposed this. So let him give a draft. So the Minister said, Can you give me a draft? So in my own handwriting, I made a rough sketch. And later, that government was defeated. But the government that came after that in 1971 took that and ultimately captured this law. Now I'm just mentioning that to tell you that your trade unions, you all look to parliament, you look to the Labour Party, <coughs> also to enact laws. Is that good? My advice to you is do anything and everything you can where you are with the people whom you can. end up by saying that I am totally opposed to people who man what are called the Human Resources Department. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you, my two biggest branches are in garment factories of a major Asian transnational based in Hong Kong, privately owned by a Chinese woman billionaire. Marjorie Young, you can find the Google. And they own and completely manage, or partially own and totally manage, about 47 factories in Asia. Several of them, and the biggest in China itself. They own land in China and they have what's called integrated production, where they produce their own cotton and make their own yarn for the factories. There are four in my country. Of course, four, two are organized in my room. One has about nearly 900 members. Nearly all, the entire committee are women. The secretary, the president, is a small man, woman who has worked there 25 years. You might be interested to know that when she was previously elected, I saw that she was sick and she was appealing to the her members not to re-elect her, but they insisted. But I knew she was sick. I went home on a Sunday and I told her name is Manel. I said, Manel, you are sick. My union is going to take you out of that factory for one full month and we will get you medical treatment and find out what your sickness is. Because I found that before she got ill, her weight was 47 kilograms. After she fell sick, her weight had gone down to 32 kilograms. And she works in that factory 10 hours a day, 6 days a week, nearly 50 weeks in the year. That is the kind of life that a woman work, married woman work, has to live today in our country. So and that's why I say is there's a human resources department. In Hong Kong, they have an American woman, very educated, motivated, who is the corporate social responsibility director. <coughs> so they have a, to show to the world an American. 
corporate social responsibility director <laughs> of the ownership and the control is Chinese. I met that director across the table and she had heard of me, she had done a Google study on me and she came to my unit and wanted to have a one round meeting with me. So I met her and I'm glad to say that she told me in our factories we have never yet had to deal with a genuine independent union like yours. Well, that's my experience. I can say more. I need to ask all the questions you want, but you must say Dan, who is a much more experienced international trade union leader than I am. Thank you. Uh, about your experiences and without further delay I hand over to Dan. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Bala. Uh, I want to speak about uh, different perceptions. The, um, earlier um, in the, um, uh, yeah, yesterday we were talking and uh, Bala mentioned the, uh, how, how differently the movement is perceived from the international level and from the local level and uh, he has uh, experience of both but of course his home is the local level but uh, the the uh, we also heard from Dave uh, yesterday who described us uh, a, a brief uh, summary of the international trade union movement and uh, the uh, I want to stress uh, in addition to the uh, to what he um, described the uh, street net and the international domestic workers networks as uh, uh, typical of the new organizations that are coming up of informal workers and it, uh, this is absolutely a crucial issue for us but the the uh, picture general picture that uh, emerges is that we we are dealing with an extraordinarily fragmented movement fragmented in terms of organizations but i think more importantly even in terms of perception of society, the the uh, uh, the um, what all these organizations have in common is that the workers' organizations that you uh, expect you to expect that there would be some uh, uh, common denominator, recognizable common denominator in the policies, and that is not always the case. And this is uh, uh, we have to look at why why that is. <coughs> the because. Uh, what we are facing is the onslaught of capital and that is very much coordinated and unified with a common narrative uh, about society which is w something that we that our movement has lost the uh, uh, <coughs> so I, I don't think our problem is not so much the fragmentation among organizations but the fragmentation of of perception uh, the reason for this is partly, uh, and this is a paradox, the, the very success of the movement in the sense that the international trade union movement, and I use the word uh, movement, uh, is uh, for the first time uh, truly worldwide and uh, uh, <coughs> encompasses a far greater range of societies and cultures than at any previous time in its history. <coughs> the <coughs> Consequently, of course, it is also exposed and affected by much greater diversity of, uh, uh, <coughs> of cultures. Uh, the second reason is that at the same time, uh, its leading organizations, mainly in industrialized countries, had become largely depoliticized. <coughs> and this has been the uh, consequence of a, a long series of uh, events after World War II, uh, a long series of defeats, uh, when a weakened trade union movement in Europe became increasingly dependent uh, on the state and uh, 
in the context of the capitalist reconstruction after the war and in the context of the Cold War uh, retreated to what it believed to be its core business, uh, collective bargaining, and left society to the state. And in, the, in this context, the merger of the ICFTU into WCL, uh, International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, World Confederation of Labor, in 2006, uh, was uh, acquired by erasing the last vestiges of what social democratic policies that remained in the, I, in the ICFTU. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, such progressive tendencies that had existed in the WCL, basically liberation theology, had also been greatly weakened. So what you had was a merger on the lowest, on basis of the lowest common denominator. And to such an extent that the, the uh, result, the ITUC, is uh, practically adrift without any recognizable uh, politics. <coughs> what this has done is to de deprive the workers of the world of a universal and common uh, narrative about society, what it is, how to change it. Uh, uh, like, for example, the social democratic, uh, democratic socialist narrative that existed uh, in the interwar years, up to World War II, uh, the, and which uh, today survives only in some global union federations and, of course, in a, in a number of, of, national, of national unions. And, and this loss of the, of the universal narrative uh, uh, that we share in common uh, is a critical problem because it weakens uh, international class consciousness uh, and abandons political consciousness to widely different perceptions uh, of society shaped by local <coughs> or re regional politics. For example, for example, the ETUC, European Trade Union Confederation, which is politically and financially dependent on the European Union, is deliberately and sometimes aggressively Eurocentric. And even more than the ITUC subscribes to, subscribes to a theory of social partnership, which has long been abandoned, long since been abandoned by our presumed social partners. Then you have the Latin American unions, acutely sensitive to the dangers of American imperialism, uh, far less aware or concerned about what happened to the workers in, for 70 years in the USSR uh, and for 40 years of Stalinism in Eastern Europe. Uh, and in the country, Eastern European countries under its domination. M much the same applies to the South African unions, with politics shaped by the anti-apartheid struggle. Their physical, uh, some intellectual and emotional remoteness from really existing Stalinism <coughs> has enabled the WFTU to get some undeserved uh, uh, credibility and uh, socialism, in quotation marks, by Stalinist definition, seems an attractive option, even, at, uh, even though at, at a safe distance in time and place, approximately 7,000 miles away. Then you have the unions in the former Soviet bloc, emerging from the wreckage of a society where all forms of independent labor organizations were suppressed for decades. Uh, they, they have no ideology at all. Their main problem has been to repudiate the so-called socialism, again in quotation marks, which by its Stalinist definition was the ideology of the rulers, the ideology of a police state. Some parts of it have embraced, of the, of the move, uh, trade unions in, in Eastern Europe, have embraced the neoliberal ideology of the natural enemies, of the new capitalist classes to come in. And some of its more radical elements have been attracted to revolutionary syndicalism because its uh, class struggle <coughs> politics are less tainted with the vocabulary of, uh, of their enemies. Not having experienced apartheid, they would be totally unable to understand how the political hegemony of the South African Communist Party 
over the South African labor movement came about. And what what would make the WFTU an, an attract, appear an attractive option to the South African workers? Polish Solidarity, a movement of 10 million members at its peak in 1981, with a strong left-wing left component, has since been hijacked by Catholic conservatives, has endorsed neoliberal policies, has invited Margaret Thatcher to its Congress, and is down to uh, one million members. China, the largest nation on earth, has a trade union structure inherited from the Soviet model. The government has embraced capitalism, but has maintained the trade union structure designed to control the working class rather than, than the representative. Uh, while the ITUC and others are closing up to it, workers throughout China are daily revolting against it and revolting against the system. The question is, which side are we on? I could go on for, like this for a long time. There are many, many examples of what, 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 I, what I'm trying to, 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 to make, the point I'm trying to make. So, the, the, the present labor movement uh, resembles far too much uh, the, the, the blind men of the parable who are trying to find out what an elephant looks like and come up with incompatible answers. And our task, uh, uh, our challenge, is to reconstitute the full view of the elephant. Now, how, how do we do this? Uh, the trade union movement, such as it is, is what we have. Uh, and that has to be our point of departure. Uh, our task is to recover the politics which are naturally ours, uh, the politics of our class, uh, and reconstitute our identity as a movement of our class. We, we must recover a common understanding, uh, recover our common narrative about his, our own history and about our society, about society we live in. And all of us need to rise above and reach beyond our own experience, which is, all, which is of necessity only a part of reality. Uh, <clears throat> open up to the experience of others, always critically, of course, but always with patience and respect. Rebuilding the movement from below, always remembering that we are part of one world working class. We, we must become internationalists. Socialism remains our goal, but instructed by experience, we know that <clears throat> the meaning of socialism to, today must be radical democracy. Real power, democratically exercised by real people at every level, not by any substitutes, no vanguard parties, no so-called progressive autocrats. Uh, we cannot delegate the fight for the emancipation of labor to anyone else. Finally, we must always keep in mind that we are part of society, that our goals are no different from the general interest of society. We are not a special interest group like our enemies would have it. We, we are at one with society. And, and therefore, we must remain aware that there are many social movements not directly linked to labor, but sharing many of our, our uh, objectives, who are or who should be our allies. Many have filled the void left by the labor movement when it retreated to business unionism uh, and to administering uh, 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 post-war capitalism uh, known as a social market economy. We need those movements as allies because we're not strong enough ourselves, just by ourselves, to turn society around. And if we have to create broad coalitions, uh, broad political, worldwide political coalitions that will eventually liberate us from capitalism. Uh, I, I have in mind movements like, for example, the Clean Clothes Campaign, which has done more for, for textile workers than the International Textile Labor, uh, Labor Garment Workers Federation has done for years, 
I'm thinking of movements like the world, like women in informal employment organizing uh, and, and globalizing and organizing, which has been pioneering the organization of informal workers into unions and so forth. We can discuss this further uh, later. Uh, the, the basically the, the social movements are the movements of women, the movements around the environment protection, and and, and hu human rights movements. Well, uh, comrades, this summer school has a lot to do with uh, uh, the the uh, with meeting our, our political challenges. Uh, we, we have created we the GLIs have created a free space for discussion and action. Uh, the, uh, this free space is expanding. Use it and keep keep uh, uh, using it. Uh, we have no bureaucratic structures. Uh, we do not aspire to be any sort of bureaucratic hegemony. We are a network of uh, autonomous and self-determined trade union activists working together and working with others uh, with a common, for a common cause, which is uh, rebuilding the international trade union movement in such a way that it becomes what the workers of the world need and deserve. Uh, thank you. take a little bit of time before we start with, with the working groups for, to, to, uh, to give the floor to you. I mean, there's no way that I can give uh, a two-phrase summary of all this was has been said. Um, I, I just think that the, we, we got from both of you a, a kind of a broad picture and kind of um, puzzle, puzzle pieces of where we are at, and I understood Dan's kind of appeal to all of us to put all these puzzles together and to and to rebuild uh, something new. I mean, uh, Bala was uh, <coughs> talking about uh, not only the political challenge but the social challenge, and both of you referred to other movements that are out there, and that uh, the trade union movement is uh, by no means in a position um, to to fight. For, for a change in society as, um, as, as, the, as the only force in, in society. And I think Dan uh, emphasized the point that we have lost a universal narrative in our movements and that obviously there are now uh, tendencies in the, in the global trade union movement to look for a new narrative. And you spoke about, I mean, looking to the kind of heritage of the Soviet Union and uh, I, th I think we would need to look at, to, uh, to put it into a, a political perspective because I think a lot of knowledge <laughs> of uh, how it came about and how it was in practice and uh, why it collapsed, um, I think we really need to have a lot of education about this because I think there is a, a lot of misconceptions about what, what this kind of um, Soviet-style uh, societies uh, were like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you appeal to us to kind of reconstitute the elephant, right? That you said. So, so this is the goal we uh, we are now all facing, and that there are no no other movements out there that we have to do it ourselves from below, and this is why we are all here. And so now I give the floor to you to ask any questions you want and to comment on anything what you want. Should we take a break or would I go directly? Should we take discussion? a break or would you, or would you carry on? I can carry on for a bit. Carry on for a bit. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So I think uh, Khalid and then your name was? Ed. Ed and then Gisela. Khalid first. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the both senior leaders uh, for wonderful presentations. Introduce uh, yourself, Khalid. Yeah. Introduce yourself, say who you okay. are. My name is Karim Shurdun and I am from Labour Education Foundation from Pakistan. And I am a political activist as well. Uh, listening to uh, Mr. Bala's uh, experience, uh, I was thinking about Pakistan. 
and with this uh, rising uh, wave of uh, extremism and fundamentalism in the society and if we think about the working class uh, and the left movement especially there are some elements who still insist on using the terminology used by the left uh, uh, in past and in, in many countries uh, even now. And there are some other people from the left movement who say to continue your work, what you want to do, how you want to do, but, but don't use that terminology. Even there are questions on using the word working class. And then there is another fragmentation of social movements and left movement, trade union, and there is no trade union movement basically in Pakistan these days. So how to, uh, for people like us, how to really relate to these terminologies and how to go forward? Um, is it necessary to use, even, even if we say comrade to each other, this is this is considered as a typical uh, um, uh, in, in that uh, uh, in the background of that typical propaganda against the communists by the uh, by the right wing forces. In other country, it is considered as they are the non-Muslims, they are the ETs, and they are that these kind of uh, sentiments are coming out. So how to really, I mean, it's, 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 it's a difficult situation for us. How to really move forward in this situation? Um, we try to continue with the work that we think is is is, is uh, for the working class without sometimes using terminology, sometimes we're using the terminology, but how to move forward? Question to both. Could we collect from one, two more, and then I'll give it to you. OK, Ed, please. Uh, hi, my name's Ed. I work for Labour Star. Uh, we do online campaigns for the unions. Um, I want to pick up on a um, perhaps a little bit of a contradiction, which is I, I, I agree completely that like politically, like the, the central point, and this came out yesterday as well, is like sort of, sort of like putting class-based socialism back into the labour movement. But then we're also talking about making alliances with sort of other social movements, new social movements. I, you know, I actually think a lot of these social <laughs> movements, the newness of them is overstated a little bit. There have always been non-socialist, like popular movements. I guess my question and maybe the contradiction to think about, and I know we're talking about anti-capitalism later in the morning as well, so maybe think about it then as well, is, we want a, a class-based socialist workers' movement, um, and but we also want to build alliances with with social movements that essentially are not class-based, really, and are not socialist, but we have some overlap with. Um, how do we you sort of square that circle? How do we make the labour movement have clear socialist politics, but also appeal to? non-socialist, sort of allies as well. Okay, Gisela? Good morning everybody, I'm Gisela Nantha. I'm going to introduce myself. I've been working with the IUF, I've been working on the CWA's T-Mobile campaign. At the moment I'm on maternity leave and just doing a little bit of, of activism with Labour Start supporting online campaigns of doing the place um, My questions would be like, Actually, too, because like you have been talking about the global labor movement, and Bala has been saying he doesn't use the term because he doesn't think there is a movement, if I correctly uh, understood that correctly. And then has been saying, I will be talking about a movement. So my question would be to each of you, like, why are you using the term? Why are you not using the term? Mm -hmm. So, so where's the contradiction? Um, why, why you think there is a movement? Um, and the other question is um, also relating to those like mostly rather short-lived social movements that we've been in the la that we have seen in the last years, like the Arab Spring movement, which is not so short-lived, but like coming in those waves and protest movements in Southern Europe and in Israel and in US, 
with the 99% movement. Um, my perception would be that these are, have a lot of movement, but not a lot of organizational structures, which is why they die quite quickly. Nobody's speaking anymore in the US about 99% movement, as far as I can see. Um, and how could they be like, or how could the trade unions relate better to those movements? Because the trade unions, unions today, the other way around, maybe have too much organizational structure and too few movement in them. So the two could be combined. Might give more strength to both of them. So, what would you think? What would be the chances of relating those things better together? Thank you. Okay, as I can see, uh, no more hands at the moment. I would uh, maybe ask Bala first to respond. What do you mean no more hands? I think there were, there were more hands that you left out. What do you mean no more hands? I didn't see you. Ah, yeah, yeah. there's something wrong with your glasses. I mean, <laughs> uh, are you asking you ask a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Question. What What was the question? No, no, he did, I didn't see his hand going up. Okay, yeah, please, there. feel free. Okay. <laughs> my, my name is Sadiq Gain from South Africa. Okay, um, thanks for the two presentations. I think they are, they are helpful. I just have a few questions. Um, I think the answer is we need radical democracy. I mean, if you go back to Pluto and, and them who wrote about democracy from when it started in Athens. It was radical democracy, but then the other writers challenged that form of democracy. So it would be nice to hear what it is, is what is happening in Egypt, the radical democracy that you're talking about, is it sustainable? Um, uh, uh, so it would be nice to, to just say more about the radical democracy. <coughs> the, the broad collisions will liberate us from capitalism. I think that's what you said. Um, how how do we form those broad collisions? What experiences can we use? I mean, uh, if you use the example of the social movements vis-a-vis -vis traditional trade unions, uh, you you then have to talk about the issue of uh, who is who is normally behind social movements. Um, are they formed by trade unions or are they formed by academics or what, what relationship do they have with trade unions? Uh, have we studied that kind of relationship enough? Because, from, for example, what happened in, in Zimbabwe, it, it was so easy for Mugabe to to ban NGOs, uh, uh, NGOs that were working with social movements, uh, because he used the media to say that uh, they were there formed, they were working with the CTU to, to work against a so-called progressive government. And, and that's what the end of the social movements in, 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 in that country. But maybe in, in, in Egypt is another experience, maybe in other places is, 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 uh, is other experiences, so we need to say more about it. I'll, I'll be very careful of, uh, of saying that uh, uh, it was because of the ignorance of South African working class or South African organizations uh, about the effects of Stalinism that they, they decided to to interact with WFTU. Uh, saying that we seek and hired. Of belonging, of belonging to one labor center. Let's belong to both of them. Because remember the, 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 the issue here, South African workers are not saying move away from that one. They are saying that at some point we must achieve unity. What if that is a radical democracy? Thanks. Okay, Deb, would you like to, to answer first? Well, what, uh, what do you mean there's no movement? There <laughs> questions from different points of view, but starting with the Pakistani comment, I think what he, the question he raised you should consider, and that is culture. I happen to 
first to visit Pakistan as a resource person for a combined conference of, of three ITSS, or I, IAS. I came from the IAS. First time I went to Pakistan. And at that time, I saw the Pakistan trade union movement, as it's called, was all a collection of unions. There was no common movement. And nearly all the major leaders of trade unions in Pakistan were there. Most of them had beards. All of them looked to be over 40. Some must have been in their 70s. And I knew that amongst them there are also Muslim fundamentalists. But they all came together. And when I spoke to this very strange audience, I thought I'd tell them just a few words about my own union. So I mentioned that my union consists of people who talk in three different languages. And that amongst them, there were majority Buddhists, Hindus, <coughs> Muslims, and Christians, Catholic, and Protestant. All were in my union under a unitary constitution. That's what I explained. Then there was a break, and I had noticed. One person fairly near to the platform, although they are in faces and Muslim headgear, and he was taking notes. So I was also very interested in my first visit to Pakistan. <coughs> so at the break, he said he wanted to speak to me, and he came up the platform. The chairperson was a bank clerk who was there spoken in English. So he said he wanted to translate. And I got very interested because he looked at his notes and like a true follower of the prophet, <coughs> as all Muslims know, he started by saying, everything comes from Allah. And then he said, Allah, sometimes Allah sent us the prophet. But Allah also sometimes sent messengers to us. And He said, When I was listening to you, that's to me, from what you said, I thought to myself that you are a messenger from Allah. <laughs> so there am I, a messenger from Allah. <laughs> now, what I say is, what strikes me is, He sees me in terms of His culture. And he gets a message from me of workers unite together despite differences of language and religion in terms of his culture. And I've learned the same with my own members. Over 90% of the members of my union are Buddhists. But they're also workers. And once we tried to organize in 1973 a workers' party from within the union and some other unions. And when we mooted the idea in our executive committee, there was one member, a machine operator, but also in Buddhist culture, he's a poet. And in, when the poet, they sing their poetry was called a Kavi. And he said, listening to me makes me, he knows I'm a Marxist. But they are not Marxists. But now I am advocating a workers' party. And he started, professed his, professed his remarks by saying, we are Buddhists. Now when he said we are Buddhists, I knew he is differentiating himself from Marxist. He didn't want more Marxists. But we are workers. That taught me again something which I think 
even Karl Marx and Engels, young men in their twenties when they wrote the Clemens Manifesto. I don't think that they, with all due respect to them, really gave adequate thought to human cultures and that different people of different cultures look at things, <laughs> the light and view of their own cultures. And if you are really going to combine human beings, we must learn to understand their cultures and then to try to communicate with them in terms of their cultures. And I have learned, when I speak to my Indian members, later on, I quote the Buddha. And one of the sayings of the Buddhas, Buddha, anyone had that said, which is, May all beings be without suffering. Sometimes it's the other way, may all beings be happy. Siya du sattyan ni dupeka. That's in Sanskrit Buddhist terminology. I address committee members my union. They do often. Committee members, elected. I start by saying, how many of you are so-called Buddhists? When I say so-called, Inya Bhaudra, they say, why Inya? Why so-called? I said, okay, you are genuine Buddhist. Do you accept the same? Siyadu Satyan Dukweva. Now they are all Buddhists. You all know the saying of the Buddha. Then in different ways. Well, yes. Now I'm Casual workers, on a temporary day to day basis. And I can tell you, I don't know about your experience. Many workers are very selfish. Yeah. Yeah. Very selfish. Mm -hmm. They think only of their own particular interest. Sometimes their own particular category in the factory. Yeah. Very narrow. You have to try to overcome that if they are going to combine as workers. So I tell them, okay, now in your factory, are there casual workers? Yes. Are they in the union? No, they are casual. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, some of our workers, they use the English term. They are there. They are there. English term. They are not. You don't think of them in terms of joining the union. So I say again, I put to them, I very often think and talk in terms of questions. And there is in signal an expression, Madhavila. Madhavila means stuck in the mud. So I say, now you all are people who are not stuck in the mud. You have reached high ground. That means you are permanent. But others are still in Madhavila. You have reached the high ground. You join the union. And you want the union to take you higher up the ground, to still higher ground. Do you think about the people who are still Madhavila? I said, at least in this union, before you go higher up, look to the people of Madhavila and give them a hand to get them also onto the ground. So in that way, I present some ideas of workers unity in terms of their Buddhist culture. And I seriously think that Marx and Engels, I know it, I didn't say, overlooked or adequately appreciate differences in culture. So I must say that as a general observation. Now terminology, again, is a matter of culture. And there, I would like to quote Trotsky. Something I learned from a little book that Trotsky wrote, worth reading, after the revolution, called Problems of Life, mm -hmm. in which he was trying to teach Russian workers to develop their understanding and education, to be their own journalists, instead of relying on professional <coughs> And then he made a statement, 
ที่ใช้เลิร์นแล้วก็ทีเป็นที่ Infecting the employee's expectation is still on. And I'm quoting one of the employee's expectation. Uh, I put it on his wall in his room. <laughs> and what Trotsky wrote was this: We think in language. We think in language. Clear and precise language is an essential prerequisite of clear and precise thinking. That's Trotsky. And I can tell you from all my experience, many people don't think clearly because they don't think clearly in their own language. But the worst thing for me, if you address a person in his own language, what a h i n d i s his mother or her mother tongue, you connect much better. So although I was educated in English, although in a I have practiced as meeting of the ITF in London. I once corrected a draft in English. I corrected David Cockrock, who the general secretary had just retired. You might be interested to no, know I wrote a small letter giving my best wishes. He was retired on 31st May after being 20 years general secretary of the ITF. And I said I'm coming to some summer school. And he said, and I said I've been advertised to w i t Dan g a l l y as one of the most experienced t r a i n i n g s in the world. And then he said, "Well, I know Dave Spooner." What <laughs> 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 he said? That is something our chairperson said here. He said, "You know, I was just wondering why he has invited you to, because the." Summer school, I thought, was mainly for young people. <laughs> <laughs> so here you are, an ancient. i s just young people. What's the need? What's the need for you to listen to ancients? <laughs> well, I don't know. You may regard me as an ancient, but I'm not so very old in my mind. <laughs> When it comes to language, I have spoken in many countries to work people who talk different languages. Many countries, but I have communicated normally through a translator. But I have always found that if I pick up a few words here, and if you address a Muslim and say "Salam alaikum," "Ale alaikum," at once he say "Alaikum salam," "Salam," and there's a connection. So that's why I say I just leave that thought for you. Culture, try to understand what is the culture, what is the language. Muslims in Britain today by m i a n t o n is alien, but they are human. So British workers, you might have Muslims coming to your factory. Try to understand them in terms of their culture. That applies to all. I know we are completely running out of time, but I would like to give Dan the last chance to respond to the to the questions that were coming up, and then I think we take a break, and then we take over. Okay? Well, very 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 quickly, uh, on 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 this terminology issue, I think uh, uh, I agree completely with what b a r n a r just said. Uh, the uh, uh, I don't think we need to use. Uh, uh, Terminology that is sectarian and provocative. What we have to be careful about, though, is not using the language of the enemy. For example, uh, uh, the, as as you will have noticed, uh, there is a whole new terminology that has developed about industrial relations, labor management relations, from from the EU and from. Uh, uh, <coughs> and so, I don't think we should talk. About class relations in terms of social partnership, that is the language of the enemy, and and the other such catchwords which are entering the language, which we should combat and 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 uh, not 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 use. The uh, um, let's see, um, yeah, uh, non non social social movement. Well, <laughs> uh, some sometimes I have I have. Uh, I don't have any more difficulty working 
with uh, social movements that are not explicitly socialists than I have with non-socialist socialist parties. Uh, <laughs> <I don't think. laughs> we just uh, we just have to be clear about objectives and make alliances on the basis of objectives. And uh, 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 the uh, uh, I, I don't think that the 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 the. Uh, the, 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 the way the movements originate necessarily uh, determine how they develop and how our relations with such movements can can develop. Uh, the uh, I've absolutely I've no idea, no no more than you do, what is going to happen with uh, mass protest movements that have emerged. Uh, uh, recently, especially of the youth in Spain, the Indignados, the Occupy movement, uh, and, uh, but uh, the the uh, clearly a, a movement of that size and that composition is of necessity uh, includes very many workers. Uh, I mean, the, the vast majority of these people are. are Either unemployed or uh, or working for, for 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 wages or in some other way, and uh, <coughs> in in some fashion we have to uh, um, find a way of relating to them. But I think that will be the subject of later uh, discussions on, on this uh, in this meeting in this uh, uh, summer school. We're we're coming. I think we're coming to that. Uh, <coughs> What am I forgetting? Uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, you know, Bala has speaks for international organization. I speak for our international labor movement. I don't think it. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I, I'm, I speak. I describe it as a movement because it is composed of workers who, whatever the organizations might be doing, are moving, and uh, uh, it 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 is it is. Uh, Developing in, in in some fashion, but I, I think it's really uh, let's not. We don't need to get hung up on this uh, on this kind of terminology. I don't think it's a very profound difference. Um, <coughs> the uh, radical democracy. The uh, uh, the. Um, uh, there is there is um, a whole literature about workers' control, which is uh, interesting, important. There's unfortunately much fewer uh, practical applications of this uh, of of this, uh, but the, they do exist. And uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, in in the early stages of the Russian Revolution, the uh, say the first two years. Uh, uh, Spain, uh, uh, Catalonia, May 36, before it was suppressed by the communists. Um, the uh, <coughs> uh, today, today there's a, uh, uh, the self-managed factories. Uh, the <coughs> I think we can be pretty clear what. Uh, Political democracy is not not substitutionism, not no delegate, not delegate. Uh, I mean, it's it's a long subject. Uh, I, I don't think I I can really get into it at, at this point. Um, about the social movements, we, we don't necessarily have to always think there's somebody behind it. Uh, for example, I think in the movements that we have been talking about here, like Occupy, like the Indianados and so forth, there is nobody behind it. It's not a conspiracy. It's a true mass movement. I think the same t is applies to Egypt. What's happening in Egypt? That it's it's you you cannot explain.